All right. So welcome everybody. We're going to talk about trees and why we love them and should they should be protected tonight. Um, I'm Lisa C. Sam with the Thurston Climate Action Team, otherwise known as TCAT. And I'm also on the uh, in the Tree Action Group. And Lynn Fitzhugh, who's the Community Engagement Director for TCAT, is assisting me tonight. She initiated this webinar. She also put our group together. She put all the groups together in TCAT. She does really great work. And um, so she will be fielding the questions. If you, have, if you have any questions going along, just put them in the chat box and we will address them after the slideshow. A little bit about me. I, um, I arrived here three years ago from Los Angeles. And about 15 years ago, I changed careers and became a certified horticulturist. And I worked at an LA uh, County Botanic Garden where I created, designed, installed, maintained gardens. The principles I worked by were always um, climate appropriate plants, wildlife appropriate plants, water wise, chemical free. And I was very involved in the horticulture community there. I served on the board for the Southern California Horticulture Society. And I also served on the board for my local chapter of the California Native Plant Society. So now I'm up here and just having a lot of fun with the native plants here, uh, creating gardens on my property. Um, but again, my focus is, is the natives and um, really enjoying it and planting for wildlife. And I have a lot of trees on my property. I'm very fortunate, but I put in some more last year, including a Gary Oak, which is the delight of my soul. I just love having a Gary Oak tree on my property. So you can see I'm very enthusiastic, very passionate about plants. And uh, those of us on the tree action group are very passionate and enthusiastic about trees and about protecting them. So that's what we're hoping to share with you tonight. So let's get started. So as you can see in this first slide, we have our mascot which is the Lorax. And some of you may be familiar with Dr. Seuss's book, The Lorax. I just got it for my five-year-old granddaughter and she loves it. And this is a quote from the book. I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I speak for the trees for the trees have no tongues. Here's the outline. Some of the subjects we're gonna be covering tonight, the benefits of trees, which are myriad local tree ordinances and how to improve them so we can better protect trees. The Thurston Climate Mitigation Plan, which dovetails with the work we're doing for protecting trees. And then what you can do and some resources. So this graphic is from the Nature Conservancy. You can find it on their website. And it's a, it, Pretty nice one, it's pretty easy to read, understanding the benefits of urban trees. And you can see there are many, many benefits. They benefit us, uh, our health, mental, emotional, and physical. They reduce pollutants. They take pollutants out of the air, making it cleaner for us. They manage stormwater and prevent pollutants from going into our bays. Um, they provide habitat and they're protecting biodiversity. They cool very hot cities and they increase property values, not such a bad thing. So let's start with air quality and how they improve air quality. Typical city residents are exposed to an average of 200 different classes of air pollutants in a day. Just walking down the street, cars speeding by you, if they're not electric, there are a lot of pollutants coming out and you're breathing them in. Well, Street trees help us. And in 2019, the city of Olympia street trees alone removed 2,500 pounds of air pollutants, among them a reduction of 327 pounds of sulfur dioxide, which is a byproduct of vehicle emissions. They lower asthma rates because they remove pollutants from the air. And that's been scientifically proven. In trees that have a high density of, of 
excuse me, in neighborhoods that have a high density of trees, there are lower rates of asthma. Low income neighborhoods tend to be less treed. There are just fewer trees there. And so people who live in those neighborhoods tend to be more prone to having respiratory disorders like asthma. And I think the, all these crises that we're experiencing this year, the COVID crisis, I think we've all been made acutely aware of how low-income people, and in particular black and brown people, are more prone to these respiratory disorders and therefore more vulnerable to the COVID virus, to contracting it and to dying from it. So we can see the intersectionality here between environmentalism and social justice. It's really important. I won't belabor the point. I think, again, we're all very aware of what's happening. But um, this just shows how trees can help with this issue. Trees prevent heat islands. So what are heat islands? They're areas in urban cities where there are just a great density of buildings, sidewalks, driveways, asphalt streets, all very, all impermeable. They tend to hold on to heat. And so the air temperatures can be higher by as much as 12 degrees <coughs> compared to surrounding areas. And so what these high heat islands do is, and you can see the list here, they increase the energy demand in the summer. People are using their air conditioning more. So it costs more. It also increases air pollution and contributes to higher emissions of greenhouse gases. There are heat related issues and even mortality. Uh, trees can help prevent that. They work, work to defend against the heat islands. They cool them because they provide shade. They absorb solar radiation. They provide natural air conditioning via transpiration. And transpiration is the release of moisture and oxygen from the leaves. That's how they breathe. They clean the air, which allows heat to escape into space. This is a really great graphic. This is the heat island map, and this is of downtown Olympia. The Build, there are buildings here that are the orange dots and the blue dots. I bet you can guess which ones are the cooled buildings. They're the blue dots. The orange ones are not cooled. And what are the blue dots surrounded by? The purple dots and the purple dots are the street trees that are shading those buildings. And they're blue because they've been cooled by those trees. Olympia street trees alone provide annual energy savings of an estimated $785,000. So buildings are the second highest polluter in Thurston County. Vehicles, of course, are the number one, but buildings come right after. And trees that are in proximity to buildings can cool them. Saying, so it's lowering the need for air conditioning. So electric bills decrease and so do carbon emissions. Here's that heat map again. And you can see the trees around, the purple dot trees around the blue buildings that have been cooled. The trees are providing these cooling benefits in the summer, but they also provide wind chill reductions in the winter, which also can result in energy savings for nearby buildings. Olympia street trees provide an annual electricity savings of $760,000 and natural gas savings of $24,000. Another service trees provide us is stormwater retention. And that's really important here. Because in the winter, you know, with flooding and runoff, uh, when we have a lot of rains, that's just really important that we have some way to intercept it. And probably the cheapest way to go, rather than technology, is just planting more trees. So they reduce and slow stormwater by intercepting precipitation in their leaves and branches. They're just slowing it down as the rain comes down. And so the water infiltrates into the soil but in a typical urban setting where there are a lot of buildings and a lot of those other impermeable surfaces like 
driveways and sidewalks, there's a lot of water runoff. And that runoff can contain a lot of pollutants from cars and everything, and they, that runoff goes right into our bays. If you look at the graphics here, compare them. The one on the left is showing trees with a natural ground cover. There's only a 10% runoff of water. On the right, you see there's a 55% runoff. So trees can help prevent downstream flooding, stream bank erosion, habitat destruction, sewer system overflows, and contaminated streams, rivers, and coastal water. Evergreen trees can mitigate runoff when it's most needed in the winter because deciduous trees not having leaves, they're not going to be as effective in that season. So we really need to plant more evergreens wherever there is space for them, wherever we can. Trees also prevent desertification and drought prevention. The, um, well, if you look at the clouds in this photo, that's a result of transpiration, the trees breathing out the moisture. They release the moisture, it gets recycled, and we get rain from those clouds. So there's this constant cycle of the release of rain and oxygen, and, or moisture and oxygen, and then it comes back down as, as rain. So the trees are helping maintain moisture in the soil and the atmosphere. And by doing so, they're supporting all the life around it, all the understory plants and all the wildlife. And they are regenerating the forest as a result. So as the planet heats up, we're in greater danger of desertification and drought and fires. And we're seeing that more and more. I mean, the West has seen horrible fires. The state, more fires and has ever been seen before, just annually. We have so many fires and trees, planting trees can help prevent this. So we have our own rainforests here. The photo in the prior slide and this photo are of the Olympic Peninsula. It's our own temperate rainforest. And it's second only to the Amazon rainforest in its ability to sequester carbon. And a fun fact, Watershed Park right here in Olympia is also a temperate rainforest and a wetland. Trees provide wildlife habitat. They provide food and shelter for birds, insects, and small mammals. And this photo is showing a bee on a maple blossom, which are really critical. We have lots of them here. I have a lot of big leaf maples on my property. When the bees emerge from the nest, you know, where the larvae have developed and they're emerging, the, the new bees are emerging very early in the spring, right away they're looking for flowers. They need that food source right away. And big leaf maples, they, um, they flower early in the year. So they're helping to support and perpetuate our bee population. And there are the emotional, mental, and physical health benefits of simply seeing a tree. Boosts the immune system, lowers blood pressure, reduces stress, decreases depression levels, improves mood, increases ability to focus, even in children with ADHD. And this is based on studies. This is, this is science. Uh, they help accelerate recovery from surgery or illness. And, you know, if you just think of Providence Hospital here and how it's surrounded by trees. I know when my husband was there two years ago for surgery and in his recovery room, there was a great view of trees. And I believe that it really contributed to his healing process. Um, seeing a tree, being surrounded by trees, increases energy levels and an improved sleep. And then there's beauty, which I think is really important for our spiritual health, my personal belief. I think it would be great right now to take about 20 seconds just to think of the most beautiful tree you know. The trees in both these photographs are so beautiful. Um, on the right, you've got these huge evergreens. And we can talk right now about the services in addition to just providing beauty and just being so delightful to look at. We know that in the winter, especially, they are 
helping to retain stormwater. And there's a building nearby and they probably provide some shade to that building at some point during the day, during the summer. And of course, they're so huge, they are storing and sequestering a lot of carbon. And the ones on the right, this photo was taken during Snowmageddon. We don't often see a scene like this, but it was taken during Snowmageddon last year, overlooking Bud Bay. It's a beautiful scene at sunset. Most of these trees are deciduous. There are a few evergreen trees. One of the services they're providing here is slope stabilization. They're all on a slope, so they're preventing soil erosion into the bay and slowing down water runoff into the bay. And of course, they're providing habitat for all the birds who stick around during the winter. Carbon sink, so what are they? Trees absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. That carbon is stored in the roots in the soil, so it's drawing down, reducing carbon emissions in the air. That's carbon sequestration. Carbon sequestered in this way, <clears throat> excuse me, it helps to maintain and regenerate the surrounding community of trees and other plants. So as long as these trees live, they're going to continue to grow and increase their ability to store and sequester carbon and keep it out of the atmosphere. So this graphic shows you the whole cycle of CO2 storage and sequestration. It's every living thing in this cycle is benefiting somehow from the CO2 cycle. So trees take in CO2, which is a greenhouse gas, and in exchange, they transpire oxygen, which we breathe. So there's this wonderful reciprocity here. We, we breathe in oxygen, we exhale CO2. They take in the CO2, breathe that oxygen for all of us. So street trees in Olympia collectively sequester more than 420,000 pounds of carbon every year. It's really amazing to think about that. You see the street trees, just amazing to think just in downtown Olympia, how much they are doing for us. <clears throat> so each street tree on average has stored over 2,000 pounds of carbon over its lifetime, and it continues to store carbon as it grows. Street trees in Olympia have stored more than 5 million pounds of carbon. So the annual drawdown of total emissions here in Thurston County by trees is 2.7%. Our countywide trees are holding roughly 14 years worth of our total emissions. So let's talk a little bit more about the benefits of deciduous and evergreen trees. Deciduous trees are providing that significant cooling and shading service in the summer. And that is going to be more important. Our county is growing. We're going to need more trees. There are going to be more buildings. We need to keep our energy costs and the effects of using that energy. We need to keep that down. So uh, it's going to be really important to have more trees. And these deciduous trees do a great job of the shading and cooling in the summer. And they process one and a half million gallons of stormwater a year. The evergreens offer wind and wind chill protection. And because the deciduous trees are leafless in the winter and aren't doing that job quite as well, it's the evergreens that can really reduce the volume of urban stormwater and stormwater pollution runoff during our rainy season. So again, we really want to get a lot of those planted as best we can. Benefits of older and larger trees. Obviously, the older the tree, the bigger it is and it's going to be storing and sequestering more carbon. So we really want to protect those older trees. We do not want to see them cut down um, because they are really helping us reduce carbon emissions. In this photo, maybe you see the little girl right in the middle and then look at that big old tree that's not far from her. That's how big a lot of our trees get and um, they're quite magnificent and uh, that tree is holding a lot of carbon. So we're going to talk a little bit now about the vocabulary that is used when describing trees in tree ordinances. 
So one is exceptional. What is an exceptional tree? In most codes, an exceptional tree is uh, considered to be between 20 and 30 inches diameter at breast height, often just referred to in shorthand DBH. So as we know, these really big trees sequester the most carbon. They prevent overheating in the summer and they prevent soil erosion. Also, and this is a really important point, they tend to be mother trees. So they're making sugars, their leaves, their little factories. They're, they're taking in the sunlight, the water, and the carbon, and uh, they're making sugars. And they share those sugars with other trees that are neighboring them, maybe smaller trees, the baby trees. And they're sending the sugars, the, the nutrients, via their roots, but also through the mycorrhizae. And the mycorrhizae are those fungal strands. You can see them if you pull up a piece of bark or something, you see a little white strand. That's mycorrhizae, it's, it's fungal. And underground, or maybe just beneath the surface of the soil, they can go on and on and on for very long distances. Um, we're familiar with their fruiting bodies, um, otherwise known as mushrooms, but they play a very important role uh, the mycorrhizae are symbiotic. They have a symbiotic relationship with the tree. And so they're helping each other out and sharing nutrients and, and spreading those nutrients to other plants in the area. Significant trees are smaller than exceptional trees, uh, but they tend to be bigger than the little saplings that are under six inches. And those tend not to be protected by the codes. So they still hold a lot of carbon, and they're on their way to becoming exceptional if they're allowed to grow and they're not cut down. There are grove trees, which is eight trees or more that form a continuous canopy. And this helps to create habitat, to protect wildlife and also protects other trees and all the understory plants. And this last point is really important. Trees naturally grow in community. They are interdependent and they're connected to each other through their root systems, and they are helping each other. Then there are historic trees, which tend to be very large and very old trees. So we have one right here in Tumwater by the uh, Deschutes River. It was planted in 1845. It's the largest butternut tree in the state, one of the largest in the nation. You can see the dimensions of it, it's quite large, but it's showing just signs of decay from old age, which you would expect, but also it was mutilated by being topped, which is one of the worst things you can do to a tree, is top it. And so that was topped about 50 years ago, so what happened is water got into the trunk and it started rotting from within. That will kill a tree. So still with us, who knows how long. But anyway, this, this is uh, a good example of a historic tree, which are usually protected by ordinances. Legion Way has some historic trees. They were planted in 1928 to honor war veterans. They've grown, matured. They are oak and sweet gum trees, really nice trees. But in the 80s, because their growth was conflicting with power lines, crews came in and topped them. And you can see what happened to them. When the tree is topped, it's really mutilated. It will never grow naturally. It struggles to grow. It costs a lot to, a lot to maintain them and then, you know, they can die. And just a, a quick little story, in California, there's a very well-known uh, landscape designer named Billy Goodnick. And when he lectures, he hands out yellow crime tape that he's had imprinted with the words crime against nature. And if he's driving around and he sees a mutilated tree or shrub, he will get out of his car and wrap this tape around it, <laughs> take a picture of it and run off. He's a real tree advocate. He recognizes that trees must be treated respectfully and according to their needs. And we can't just top them willy nilly because, oh, they're running into the electric line. And that's why also it's very important to plant a tree for the site, where it's not going to get too large for it. So you don't have to resort to these practices. Well, what happens when a tree gets cut? 
And here we have our mascot again, the Lorax, who speaks for the trees, which you seem to be chopping as fast as you please. Cut down a tree, 60% of its stored carbon is immediately released, just gone into the atmosphere. So cutting trees adds to our emissions. And then the soil organisms, which have been dependent on that tree at its roots, now that tree is dead, and so they start releasing carbon. If a tree burns, pretty much all the carbon is released to the atmosphere. If it's turned into paper, much of it is released. Using trees for buildings and furniture, some amount gets stored, uh, but it's a small percentage of carbon that's captured that way. So, so we need to keep a lot of trees growing. We just added this this week, in case some of you aren't aware about uh, Port of Olympia trying to lease 200 acres of land in Tumwater, 120 of which are heavily forested. And uh, they're trying to lease it and they're fast tracking this. They're gonna vote on it on July 13th to uh, a warehouse developer. I guess he wants to do, or they wanna do what they've been doing in Lacey. And uh, it's, it's near a residential neighborhood, it's near a school, people don't want it. And if they were to cut down all those trees, we would lose 443 tons of sequestered carbon. Annually. That's what is sequestered annually. And 11,136 tons total stored. We'd also lose their stormwater services, which is really important for preventing flooding. And this is a very, very wet area, this particular, this 120 acres. We'd lose their stormwater services, which are valued at $2 million. So we think this is a, a very bad decision, very ill thought out. And we're encouraging people to please email the commissioners, tell them you do not support this. Some of you may already have, and we thank you for that. Um, they are making their decision July 13th, so if you can, get your emails in before July 13th. So, the four local jurisdictions, Lacey, Tumwater, Olympia, and the county, Board of County Commissioners, are all reviewing their tree ordinances now. And so, what we want to see is that they be clear that they have fines and enforcements and incentives, that there are guidelines for replacement of trees that must be cut down, that there should be limits on cutting, and very specific definitions of exceptional trees, significant trees, and historic trees. Here's the Lorax again, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better, it's not. So our TCAT Tree Action Group is trying to influence the process uh, of these four jurisdictions to ensure tree protection in a way that really respects what a tree needs horticulturally and all the benefits and services that it provides to us. So trees are providing all the amazing services we described today. Don't you think they deserve our protection? The Thurston Climate Mitigation Plan has managed, this is uh, the steering committee is comprised of the four jurisdictions. Um, it, the whole process has been overseen by the Regional Planning Council. And um, TCAT has really pushed for including carbon sequestration, not just carbon emissions reductions, but carbon sequestration in the plan. And it looks like we've been fairly successful at that. So right now, uh, afforestation, which is tree planting, that will definitely be in the plan. Uh, tree canopy preservation and municipal canopy, which basically would result in cities and the county planting more trees. And, uh, you know, the, the Regional Planning Council hired uh, environmental consultant, Cascadia Consultants. And in his last report to the steering committee, he said that carbon sequestration must be part of the plan. It's not just the carbon reductions through say technological means. All, all of that is important, but carbon sequestration must be part of the plan as well. And that's done through regenerative, regenerative agriculture, but also 
planting trees. I think he suggested we need to plant 40,000 trees here in Thurston County. Um, but also uh, making sure we're not clear cutting trees, keep the trees we already have. So anyway, the last two will likely be in the plan and that's due to TCAT's tree action group lobbying efforts. So what can you do? Well, planting trees is one. I wanna give a shout out here to Sharon Herding, who's my Olympia Indivisible colleague. Um, she sent this to me and another indivisible person, Pat Wald, as we were talking about how meaningful it had been for us to plant trees on our property. And she sent us this wonderful quote by Rabindranath Tagore, who was um, a Bengali poet and painter. The one who plants trees, knowing that he or she will never sit in their shade, has at least started to understand the meaning of life. So let's plant trees. And here are some suggestions uh, for researching. This is just a beginning. There are so many resources. I had one little slide to fit them onto, um, but I have found these resources to be helpful. So first off is uh, the Washington Nash, uh, Native Plant Society. They have great uh, resources for learning how to garden with natives and finding plants that are appropriate for your site. Um, there's Woodbrook Native Plant Nursery, which I believe is the closest uh, native plant nursery. It's up in Gig Harbor. I've been there several times. And Burnt Ridge Nursery, which you probably all know, it's at the farmer's market all the time. And of course they have a website. And the woman who is at the booth there, she's very knowledgeable. And so you can ask her a lot of questions. And they do sell, it's not just fruit trees, they sell a lot of native trees. And then these two books I've found very helpful for learning about native trees and other natives. Real Gardens Grow Natives by Eileen Stark. She's out of uh, Portland. And then this is kind of the Bible that's been around for a while, this next book. And uh, it, was, uh, it was redone and uh, released last year, the second edition. It's really terrific. It has color plates now. So, and that's Gardening with Native Plants of the Pacific Northwest. And then I put in a few smaller trees because a lot of people just don't have room for a, a big dug fir or, or a big leaf maple. So here are some alternatives. Evergreens, the shore pine. So I don't have personal experience with this, but I've read that shore pines, which can get quite large, tend to stay small if they're in a smaller space. And they're just beautiful. Um, mountain hemlock, Alaska yellow cedar, variety pendula, those are just a few and they're lovely. And then we don't really have small deciduous natives, but the vine maple, it's considered a tall tree-like shrub, but it can get 25 feet high. So it can have some sequestration and carbon storage ability, but it is a wonderful plant um, for wildlife, creating habitat, it's beautiful. And also if you have a slope, it is one of the best ones to put on a slope. It's great for slope stabilization. So here are some resources if you want to learn more. Neighborhood Tree Protectors, um, I couldn't find their website, but I discovered they have a Facebook page. So you can go there and they're doing really good work up in Seattle. Lynn might speak about this later. She's more familiar with them. Uh, but what they're trying to do to preserve the urban forest up there. There's also plantamnesty.org, working to end the senseless torture and mutilation of trees. No topping. Um, this uh, article, this newspaper article, just appeared in January, and it's about what some in Seattle are doing to try and preserve the urban forest. It might be a good model for us. And then Suzanne Smart, this is great. You can find her TEDx talks on YouTube. She is in British Columbia. And she really gives you a full understanding about how trees are communicating with each other and helping each other to thrive. She's a scientist, she, so she knows uh, what trees do and how they grow and how they thrive. But she's coming to understand some of those more subtle things about the communication and the sharing, the community that trees create. And if you want to help with tree planting, um, TCAT, 
hopefully we do one in the fall. It's kind of up in the air because of the COVID crisis. Um, also, there are other organizations that have regular tree planting parties, Oli Ecosystems, Capital Land Trust, Nisqually Land Trust. There's another one I forgot to add here called the Salmon Center, and they do tree planting more up uh, along the Hood Canal, Hoodsport area. And then recently, um, in a Zoom forum, I heard Hillary France, who's the head of Department of Natural Resources speak. She's running again to be reelected. And I always thought that she was a real staunch environmentalist. I think that she probably is, but she said something that really upset me. She talked about the need for all of us with all these crises going on to be able to source what we need locally, which I agree with that concept for sure. And she said, so we don't need to ship out for toilet paper. We've got plenty of trees here to make our own toilet paper. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, I don't, that really upset me because I don't think we should be cutting down trees for toilet paper. There are alternatives. And I get mine through a company called Grove Collaborative. I'm sure there are many more. You can do a Google search on it. But I get tree-free toilet paper, paper towels, tissues, um, they're made of bamboo and sugar cane, which are both grasses that grow very rapidly and have a lot of uses, so easily recycled. Um, so that's what I do. And there may be hemp products out there too. So I just like to encourage people to make the switch. And the last slide for a little bit of inspiration. This book, this is beautiful, The Hidden Life of Trees. Um, this is an abridged edition and it has beautiful photographs of trees. And I took this quote from the book. A chain is only as strong as its weakest link because trees intuitively know this. They do not hesitate to help each other out. I think trees are a wonderful role model for us in terms of understanding and enacting community. I would like to think of us as um, having an interrelationship with trees, uh, that we are interacting with them as if we are one community, to have a reciprocal relationship with them, that we can take care of them as they take care of us. And I hope that you will join with us in TCAT protecting trees. You would write your local representatives and encourage them to upgrade the tree ordinances. If you would write them and, and encourage them to adopt the Thurston Climate Mitigation Plan, this will go a long way to protecting trees. And if you want to join us in the Tree Action Group or any other team in TCAT, um, I'm sure Lynn can provide that contact information for you. So thank you very much. And um, I guess if there are any questions, we can answer them now. Yeah. Um, we have one um, question so far in the chat box. Somebody asked, how are Warehouser and other tree harvesters involved in the climate mitigation? Um, do, you do you want to take that one, Lynn? Um, so they're, they're not. Um, uh, there was a climate advisory committee um, that was made of, of local experts. And I do not recall anyone from Warehouser being on there. There were uh, some ar arborists and local tree experts, uh, people who worked at the local universities. Um, and I, I did feel like at least one or two of them were fairly influenced by Warehouser. Um, but the plan itself, as Lisa described, the three things that are coming out of it is a call for afforestation, um, for the city to manage its trees better, um, and then uh, for better tree ordinances. And so, um, depending on what winds up in the tree ordinances, that could have some influence on warehousing. Um, we have another question now. It says, name of the cooperative using bamboo. So I think, I think that person's asking about what you just shared about the toilet. Okay. So I buy my 
bamboo-based paper products from um, a company called Grove Collaborative, which is in San Francisco. I just order online and they ship it to me. So, and I do that, you know, every month, every two months. So they've been very reliable and um, I get a lot of good eco-friendly products from them. So that's the only one I know of it's just because it's the one I've been dealing with, but um, I'm pretty sure there are others. Okay. But it's not expensive. Also, I should point out, it's not expensive at all. Oh, good. Um, there's another question that says, why isn't afforestation going to be included in the climate mitigation plan? And I think that listener may have misunderstood what we were saying because actually it is included and it's the one Thing that was um, always in the plan, plan. So for a long time, it looked like planting more trees was going to be the only tree thing that was going to get in there. And that was kind of frustrating for us because as Lisa has explained very well in this talk, the older trees are much more effective um, at, at sequestering than new trees. So while we do need to plant new trees, um, if what you're trying to do is the best thing you can for sequestration, you want to start with protecting your existing trees. So um, it was sort of frustrating that for a while it was only a person. But now we've got uh, all three things in there. Uh, the next question uh, says, whoops, it just, um, uh, are developers limited in Thurston County to how many trees they can cut down? I don't think the Thurston County ordinances limit them. Yeah, Thurston County has, um, we, we rated the uh, ordinances and Lacey has the best one, then Olympia, then Tumwater, and then Thurston County has the worst ordinance. Uh, it's so vague and confusing in the Thurston County one that it's hard to even actually understand what they are doing. But um, in general, none of these ordinances um, make any special provision for um, developers. And uh, in some cities, they will have one set of rules for developers and a different um, set of rules for homeowners. Uh, in good codes, they tend to make it consistent. Um, and uh, if you don't have limits on cutting, then you don't have limits for developers. Um, the next question says, I believe the large timber companies uh, make most of their profit now from selling off their rural lands for development, which of course means many trees are lost. Yeah. Do you want to comment on that, Lisa? You know, I, I think that's true. And um, it just a uh, kind of just tangential is we look at how many trees have been cut down in Lacey to make room for warehouses. They're running out of room and they're losing a lot of trees. And there are a lot of landowners, homeowners there who are really upset that people just come and they buy a piece of property and they just raise the trees and nobody's monitoring them. You know, I, I have a lot of trees on my property. I um, needed to have some trimmed and I went to, uh, I, I'm in unincorporated Thurston County, so I went to county offices and I was told, well, no, you don't need to, a permit unless you're taking down a sick tree or a dead tree, which didn't make sense to me at all. So it just seems like it's all very lax and there's just not enough awareness and protections. Um, one thing we, we did look at in our tree action group was Woodenville near Seattle has just issued new ordinances that are so much more conscientious, respectful of trees, recognizing what they need, um, and having heavy fines and, and really making sure people are aware they cannot just go cut down a tree willy-nilly, you know, that they have to have a good reason to do it. So um, that's, a, I think, a pretty good model, and I hope that we have those kinds of Ordinances here, because pretty much you can do what you want here. Um, the next question says, is tree rot 
becoming more common among evergreen trees in Pacific Northwest. A large stand of urban trees managed by WSU in Bonnie Lake suffered from it, or was that just an excuse for Weyerhaeuser to harvest the trees? I don't know the answer to that, but we are hearing that a lot of trees are dying. Normally trees like a lot of maples, big leaf maples and, and the cedars and the Douglas firs that may have more to do with climate change because it's getting hotter and drier and they're not adapted to that. Um, so I don't know about those specific trees, but I do know that stands of trees throughout the state or at least here in Western Washington have been observed to be dying and they can't always figure it out. And the best guess is climate change and I know that Bellevue has actually been in contact with uh, California nursery people and horticulturists uh, talking about planting trees from that area, Central California, because wh whereas it's drier, it still gets a healthy amount of rain, a lot more than Southern California. And they believe that those trees will be better adapted to the climate in up here because it is changing. So it's sad. Well, there's um, a variety of things about climate change that are threatening to trees. Um, one is as we get more drought, um, there, we have more potential for forest fires. So we've already been seeing here in Washington several summers where there were bad forest fires and bad smoke in the air. Um, in general, the heat stresses trees, and so some of the trees will become so stressed that they will die. Uh, another thing that's been killing trees um, is um, the beetle bark invasion thing. Um, normally, in our climate here in the winter, it would get cold enough to kill off um, the larvae of those, so you wouldn't get very many of them surviving. But because it's not being as cold anymore in the winter, um, now the beetles are sort of taking off. And um, if you've driven along um, I-90 uh, into the eastern part of the state, there's whole areas where the trees along there are just dying and it's, it's just tragic uh, looking what's happening to them. Uh, another aspect of climate change which is stressing trees is um, we have um, more flash flooding. Flash flooding will take down trees um, and cause other problems for trees. Um, so in general, um, and this is kind of one of the things about feedback loops and climate change. So um, we know that one feedback loop has to do with the polar caps. And we also know that there's a feedback loop for the ocean in terms of what's happening in the ocean. But trees are another actually significant feedback loop because um, when you start getting enough climate change for a lot of forest fires and you start losing more trees, um, then you're losing all those um, cooling benefits of the trees. So you just get in a vicious circle. Um, vicious circle. Yeah. yeah. So um, any more questions anybody has in mind? And you can I, I have one more question. I don't know how, you know, I guess it didn't get on the list for some reason. I have a half dozen or so oak seedlings. They're not natives. I don't know where they're from. I got one in my yard that I planted some years ago and it's uh, almost over top in the house now and I have a three-story house. So they grow fast. They take a lot of room and I'd sure like to know somebody who could use them because they grow so fast. Uh, I'm sure that the, the one mature tree now that I have is uh, sequestering a lot of carbon given uh, its size. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's your advice? What can, what can I do with these uh, seedlings? Well, uh, do you know what, what the species is? Is they're not- I don't the know. It's and they grow fast. It's, yeah, hmm? it's not a native. I know yeah. that it's somewhere back east. I don't know if it's pin oak or the, the, that particular kind of oak that has mm -hmm. the little pinpoints on the leaves, they're really hard to tell apart. And some, I don't know, scientists can't really agree 
uh, how many attacks are there really are. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, certainly not being an oak specialist. Yeah. Uh, all I know is that uh, a lot of acorns uh, have been squirreled away in the ground and they're coming up really well this year. <laughs> That's great. Um, the only thing I can think of is, uh, is donating them. I mean, sometimes Native Plant Salvage Foundation, I think, will take plants. I mean, these aren't natives, so I, but sometimes they sell non-natives if they are adapted to our area here. Well, these so are adapted, all right. Yeah, it sounds like it. So uh, and as long as they're not invasive, well, that would be the other thing, if they're invasive um, and I disrupt ecosystems. I wouldn't call them invasive, no. Okay. Well, then, you know, you could, you could check them out. Native Plant yeah. Salvage Foundation, give them a call. They're right okay. here in Olympia. And yeah, they may that, take them. Would that be Jessica? I think another, I don't, another. Uh, what's, what's the last name? Uh, it's not Hoffman, but it's something Mon. I don't know. I know Samantha, but um, mm -hmm. I don't know everybody who works Yeah, there. okay. Well, I'll, I'll try my connections first, and then I'll get back to you if I need to. I think another thing that Appreciate. you Another thing you could do is um, if you're on the um, website next door, people will mm -hmm. often offer to their neighbors, hey, I've got, you know, extra this or that, and do you want to come by and get them? And people will just come by and get them. Yeah. That right. sounds like a great idea. I, yeah. I will do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I have a question for our audience. Um, are, do people feel like they understand what's going on with our tree ordinances, what it is we're trying for around the tree ordinances, uh, or are there questions that you have about the tree ordinance situation? Yeah, Barb. Uh, yeah, what is the uh, tree action group doing in, uh, are you approaching the city councils or you know, what kind of interaction are you having to get them to, uh, you know, adopt stronger pre-ordinances? Mm -hmm. um, you want me to address that, Lisa? Sure, go right ahead. Okay. Um, so they do, each of the jurisdictions do regularly on some kind of calendar cycle, uh, revise their tree ordinances, usually in five to 10 year range. And uh, as it so happens, all of them are right now uh, revising their tree ordinance. So that's a good time for us. Um, but the pandemic has now come along and kind of put the kibosh on a lot of things. So um, there's a bit of a, a holding action happening at the moment. But as soon as the holding action lifts off, um, they have little advisory groups that sort of review their ordinance. So what we've been doing is sort of bringing to them what we consider to be the shortfalls of their ordinances and saying, hey, look, you know, you don't have any uh, protections for exceptional trees in here, or there's no um, enforcement mechanism in here, or, um, you know, the terminology is not clear in this, you know, so we're just trying to, you know, push for better, clearer, ordinances that will actually wind up protecting the trees. And one of the things that's sort of the, you know, I guess political issue in here is um, if you simply have an ordinance that says people are not supposed to cut down trees uh, unless they're sick or unhealthy or only supposed to cut down trees a year or whatever it is you say, um, but you don't have any enforcement mechanism, it's pretty much useless. And that's the situation we're in right now. Uh, the different ones say something about what you're supposed to do or what you're not supposed to do. But like if I were to poll each of you here on um, what it is you're not supposed to do to trees in your yard, you would have no idea. And that's because um, the, these ordinances are not useful in their, in their current form. And so, Portland has actually kind of a model um, tree ordinance. And um, so they do have an enforcement mechanism and it's been found around the countries that if you have to do permitting, like, so you are allowed to cut the tree down, but you have to go get a permit to do it. Just like right now, if you're gonna build something 
onto your house. You, you're not supposed to just start hammering and sawing. You're supposed to get a permit, and that's supposed to ensure that we do some things in a good way by code, etc. cetera. Um, and so um, many cities do have permitting for trees. And so then that means that if you call a tree cutting service and say, oh, come cut down all the trees in my backyard, um, the, the tree cutting service would say, can I see your permit? And you know, now there are unethical tree cutting services too. And so um, in Seattle, where we were working on a similar thing of trying to get a, a, a good um, ordinance, um, we were suggesting that um, all the tree cutting services, you know, get their business license through the city, and that if they um, cut trees down without permits, that they would lose their tree cutting um, license. So those are some ways to try to enforce it. Yeah, enforcement is uh, is the big issue, and the county has some specific some specific rules, ordinances. They're a little hard to ferret out if you go on their website. Um, the problem is they just don't have enough people to enforce. I, I spoke with somebody in the building and planning department. He said they have three people for the whole county. So they pretty much rely on neighbors saying, hey, my, my neighbor's cutting down that, you know, 50 foot uh, dug fur and I don't think it should be cut down and then somebody might go out and check it out. But there's really not, it's not much enforcement. So the ordinances sometimes are just, they're just toothless. So um, as Lisa mentioned before, if you want to get on the mailing list for our tree action group, then you'll get notifications of when we meet. And at those meetings, we discuss um, how, to, how to make progress on these things. Most recently, we've been discussing what to do about Works a uh, rather outrageous plan to cut down 120 acres worth of trees. And um, as you can imagine, at, at the same time that our mitigation plan is calling for the planting of 40,000 trees over the next 30 years, and then here they are about to cut down 120 acres of tree. It's just, you know, it's going in the opposite direction of what we know we have to do for climate. Well, does anyone have any last questions before we say goodnight to each other? Thank you very much. Thank you for coming, everybody. It made me happy to be able to share about trees and how wonderful and special they are. And I hope you think about them that way, too. I want to thank Lisa for what a fantastic job she did with this presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Thank, yes, you thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Pleasure to share. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Is the recording going to be available on the yes. website? Yes. Good. We'll put it on the website. Absolutely. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm.